what's it look like? Let me check my phone. We're just gonna have some extra prayer tonight because we're the same way we sit. You can sing now. Do you want to sing? I would totally let you sing. You can sing Jesus loves me, or Jesus loves little children, or this little light of mine. Or you can sing Love Like a River. That one's fun. It has lots of hand motions. Yeah, love like a river. You don't have to. I won't put you on the spot. But I would like uh, you and Beatrice to sing sometime soon. Yeah, I'm going to sing like the light of mine. That'd be good. But someone that's Christian can play my awesome. Mm -hmm. But like a world in my work. Um, yes. The world looks like I'm singing the light of mine. <laughs> like, uh, During that's, work? Yeah. That's funny. And then other people um, are not really Christian. They uh -huh. just figured out that there's a God inside of the um, What? Just because you don't have any faith doesn't mean I got to stop mine. Yeah. Just tell them because you're just because you're deficient in faith doesn't mean. <laughs> That's the kind of stuff. I'll pray for your deficiencies in faith. That's right. There you go. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thank you for being in Bible study this evening. Uh, pray for my family, please. Eliza is still having, like, really bad kidney stones, and I, she hadn't tweaked her back. And Tristan is coughing like a seal. And uh, uh, poor Beatrice is overworked trying to take care of everybody. So uh, <laughs> pray for them, please. Um, and so Shannon was going to lead worship. Instead, we're going to have a little bit of uh, time of prayer and uh, a little extended time of prayer this evening before our Bible study. And so I'd like to bring, bring those needs up. And does anybody else have a need for a direction in prayer that we could gather around? Brother Fowler is going to, going to Unilicleet soon? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Yes, let's lift up Unilicleet and an awakening there in prayer. Anybody else have a direction in prayer or a need you'd like to share? Yes, ma'am. Uh, my mom is in the Philippines currently. Oh, yes. My grandma is getting her pacemaker battery replaced. She's going to have all the heart surgery this morning. Okay. Absolutely. Yes, and safety for your mom returning. Yes, she's ninety-three. So wow. You never know. Wow. Yes, ma'am. So I want to pray for the Nigerians. Certainly. Like some Nigerians in her life that have had patients and born and still have their employees, and they all this stuff to do. Absolutely. We'll pray about it. Certainly. For your motivation, but also your peace around it, and to make good decisions. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's pray for these needs. Yes, ma'am. Um, I was going to say that we need to retreat coming up, and mm -hmm. for this worship conference that we're now putting on. Yes. <laughs> um, I'll share more news about that after we pray. Um, Let's pray. Let's pray for all these needs. If you don't remember them all, that's okay. I took notes. You can follow me. Uh, let's pray earnestly and sincerely. Let's also pray for our time in the Word. I'm going into a little bit of a deeper subject, and um, and it's important. It's important. There's some risk here that I'm wanting to mitigate, and so uh, let's go to God in prayer, and then we'll go to God's Word, and those together are going to safeguard our future, and together they're going to make us more able to navigate this life both physically and spiritually. And so let's pray together. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, that we can go to you with our every need. Thank you, God, that it's never wasted time to pray for, to you, God, to meet you in prayer. Thank you, Lord, that you hear all of our needs. Thank you, Jesus, that you're interested in us. You didn't have to be, and God, we're just a handful of people, God, in the corner of the world. But dear Lord, I feel your presence here so consistently. God, you've been answering prayers in this place and from this place so often, God. It's so obvious that your eye and your ear is, is attending to this place and these people. And God, I'm so grateful. 
first and foremost, God, I'm so grateful for what you've done, the ways that you've supported our faith, God, through the testimonies and the ways you've demonstrated your power and your love in our lives and in our friends and brothers and sisters' lives. Thank you, Jesus. God, I pray. Your Lord, first for my little girl. God, Eliza is just racked with pain over these kidney stones. Lord, I pray they pass. God, I pray that she wouldn't be in pain any longer. Lord, heal whatever's wrong in Shannon's back and help Tristan get over his cough before his birthday. But thank you, Lord, for all the ways our family is blessed. Dear Lord, we could be in a lot worse situations. Thank you, Jesus. Dear Lord, I pray for Ariel's grandmother, 93 years old, and needing a heart surgery. God, I pray that you would preserve her life. God, give her doctors wisdom and skill. Dear Lord, I pray she'd recover very quickly. And I pray her mother would return safely and quickly without any incident. In Jesus' name, Lord, I pray your hand would be all over that situation. God, I pray for Angelina's discipline. Dear Lord, I pray she'd have wisdom beyond her years, God, that she would understand the consequences of decisions and actions, and she would act accordingly. In Jesus' name, Lord, I pray she'd make the right decisions, God. When she doesn't know what they are, Lord, I pray you'd weigh in. God, I pray that she'd prepare herself well for her future, and dear Lord, that she wouldn't fall into the traps that so often catch us, God, of lethargy, and dear Lord, all the other traps of, <laughs> of procrastination. In Jesus' name, Dear Lord, I pray for our worship conference that's coming up, God. Dear Lord, I believe that this could be the catalyst, dear Lord, that breaks the community wide open, dear Lord, that raises the issue for many, many souls, God, the, the challenge of worship, God. Dear Lord, I pray that many people be connected to our church, God. I pray that our worship teams, God, would, would be more, more well-developed, God. They would work together well, and dear Lord, they would be advanced in their abilities, and they'd be able to serve in that way to a greater degree in Jesus' name. Dear Lord, I pray we'd be able to unify the district a little bit. We'd have other churches come and enjoy, and we'd be able to fellowship with brothers and sisters of like precious faith. In Jesus' name, Lord, I pray that they would have the liberty to come in Jesus' name. Dear Lord, I pray for the ladies' retreat. Women from all over our district, from, from hundreds and hundreds of miles away, are going to be gathering in Fairbanks, God. I pray they'd all have safety first in getting there and coming home. And secondly, God, I pray that you would meet them there, God. Dear Lord, there's special challenges. And dear Lord, there's specific needs that are going to be gathered in those souls as they gather together. And God, I pray that people would make good friends. And dear Lord, I pray, God, that they would receive the ministry that they need, God. Comfort and healing and a fit word and a due season in Jesus' name. Dear Lord, I pray that you'd meet them there and minister to them in an extraordinary way, God. The people would return. These women would be returned with testimonies, and they'd return full of zeal and fervor. And dear Lord, they would return, God, full of faith and expecting great things from you, God. Clothed being closer to you because of their time dedicated and sacrificed to be together. In Jesus' name, Lord, I pray that this would all be blessed together. Dear Lord, I pray for Brother Fowler and his ministry in Union of the God, I pray that, that that village would have an awakening there. Dear Lord, I pray that people would come to the realization that I'm not just a body, and I'm not just a, a machine, and I'm not a, a, a happenstance and, and a, a cosmic accident, but God, you know what, I pray they would feel the weight of their soul. You know what, I pray that they would see the real need they have for spiritual care, and you know what, that righteousness is is do them, and in Jesus' name, Lord, and so understanding, God, I pray that they would reach to heaven and find you. Dear Lord, I pray they would draw near to you, God, and let you draw near to them. In Jesus' name, Lord, all over rural Alaska, but God, in Unalakleet especially, since we have a minister going there already. In Jesus' name, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, amen, amen. Uh, we prayed for Ryan and Rachel Villarin uh, the last little while. They just left today to go down to Salata and uh, relocate there. They were able to buy a car. Hallelujah. I, I wouldn't have shown up to town to buy a car in one day, but they did it. <laughs> and uh, so they, uh, God bless that car to be good to them. And, uh, and so their family moved on down to Soldata. So we'll get to see them at camp if we go there. And our families, our kids have already made friends, and they're excited to meet, see them again down there. Um, the worship conference has come together really fast and really well. And so we have sessions planned. I don't have them all off the top of my head, but training sessions to develop people who are interested in worship and leading worship and being a part of the worship team. You do not have to be a part of the worship team or even be committed to joining the worship team uh, to attend this conference. Please come and learn and gather together with people who love Jesus and love to worship and praise him. And you'll be better for it. Um, there is a registration fee. We're going to have a discounted res registration for our church. Uh, so hold off on registering uh, right now until we get that, that coupon made. Uh, it's a new system for us, so I'm running out of email. Uh, we've invited every church in the district. 
uh, today. We invited every church in the district. And so we'll see who's interested enough to come. But I want to tell you a little about a little bit about um, the, the woman who's coming to, to facilitate. Uh, Cheryl McKee has 10 albums. Uh, since the 90s, she's been recording albums. She has five live projects that have been recorded. Um, she has multiple degrees, and she's recorded internationally. Um, well, what's the what's the Brooklyn choir that you like so much? Yeah, Brooklyn Tabernacle yeah. Choir. She's recorded with them, uh, all, all, all sorts of people. I put her bio in, in the thing. And so she's experienced a lot, and that's what she's coming to impart, is to give us kind of the shortcuts. Uh, I don't know if you guys have ever worked with a tradesman who really knew what they were doing, and, and they could just give you the shortcuts and just tell you this is the right way to do that, and you don't ever need to learn all the other ways. This is the, the fast way, the, the easy way, the safe way to get that done. And so that's what she's coming to, to deliver to us and bring to us in our church, and I'm excited for it. I also expect, because of her recording history and such, that we're going to be able to report uh, to uh, we're going to be able to promote this better in our community. And so Saturday night, Thursday, Friday, Saturday during the day are going to be training sessions. Saturday night. Um, our people who are interested in doing so are going to perform with her. They're going to lead a worship service Saturday night. We're going to invite the community up. And in that, we'll hopefully get their contact information and stay in touch with them and teach them what they need to know and launch them into new levels of faith. Uh, but that'll be an outreach, um, hopefully very effective outreach time because a lot of people love music. And we don't have so much coming to our part of Alaska. And so I think that we'll be able to, to generate some interest there. Uh, it's going to be a really high quality time. I'm excited about it. And, uh, and so there's that. Uh, the Millers are still going to um, Hooper Bay. Yes, Hooper Bay. Yeah. And, and Chivac, that area. Um, they're still going there. And so please continue to pray for the Millers. They're very excited to be going there. They plan to be there for three to six months this initial time. And what they're really hoping to do, and I'm telling you this so that you can be specific in your prayers, because I believe in the power of your prayers. Um, they're hoping to find some people, maybe even just one, who are willing to serve that community spiritually, willing to minister to them, willing to develop themselves in the truth of God so they can relay that, willing to be a, a local elder, if not a pastor. And that's what they're really looking to, to get a hold of. Um, our, our district is prepared to train somebody and develop somebody. Uh, we've already got the capabilities to do that. Um, and so that's what they're wanting. They want to gather people, get them saved, yes, but not leave them without somebody long-term to care for their souls. And so um, let's let, specifically, let's pray for their ability to find somebody like that. Uh, somebody had a hand up. Uh, yes, sir. I just want to, what are the dates again for the worship? Oh, it's um, June 6th through 9th. Yes. Thank you very much. I didn't, I didn't share that. <laughs> Thank you. June 6th through 9th. Yeah, it's on our it's on our calendar, um, but I might need to I might need to double check that. Um, I've got a joke for you to open this Bible study. It's a corny joke, but what did Nineveh say to Jonah after he finally made it there and prophesied destruction? Sounds fishy. Have a lot time getting here. <laughs> <laughs> they said it sounds fishy to me. <laughs> Maybe they did, but eventually they received the words of the prophet. Eventually they received the words of the prophet, and they they repented. And, and God was faithful. They received his word through the prophet, and God was faithful to forgive them when they repented. And it was powerful. The word of a prophet. Somebody who was alien to that culture. He wasn't from there. Somebody who didn't have a standing in the community. He didn't have the status of somebody who'd been there for a long time and everybody trusted or somebody who was very successful there and so people felt like, well, they have a lot of skin in the game and they wouldn't lie to us. He, he showed up with nothing but the mandate from God, the word of God, said what he was going to say and left them to it because really he didn't want them to repent. If you read the story, um, he was a reluctant minister. He, he didn't want them to repent. He, he felt like they deserved the wrath of God. And, and God is so gracious, he said, <laughs> God is so gracious, he says, well, that's going to hurt you. <laughs> that's going to that's gonna be tough on you to, to resist the Holy Ghost, to resist the, the presence of God. And um, prophets are an important part of the work of God in the kingdom of heaven. Uh, prophets are. Um, and they're real. There's real prophets inspired by God who, who do prophesy. Um, at the same time, 
there's weirdos who call themselves prophets. Yeah. I saw a book. I wish I, I wish I'd been better prepared. I've been taking care of the family and seeing the villains off and preparing for uh, promotions and stuff. I wish I'd have found this. Uh, there is a book on Amazon. You can look it up yourself. It says, "I'm not crazy. I'm a prophet." <laughs> and it's a how-to guide that if you are always having crazy ideas, it's how you can like you know wrangle those ideas into a, being a prophet. That's not the way it works. <laughs> That's not the way it works. No, the, the, we're going to get into the Bible and see what is a real prophet. I'm so proud to say, and it's, it's a righteous pride, I'm so proud to say that God has blessed this church with every gift of the Spirit. Every gift of the Spirit has happened and, and been experienced in this church over the last seven years. And you might think, well, that's a long time to, to see everything that God has for us. But the Bible says that the gifts of the Spirit, they operate as the Spirit will. As, as God sees the, the need and as somebody accepts the opportunity. Um, I've, been, I've been in meetings where God wanted to, to do something, like give a tongues and interpretation. There was nobody there who was yielding, nobody willing. And, um, and so the gifts of the Spirit are real. Prophecy is real, but it's co-opted by weirdos. There's people on YouTube and TikTok and every other video platform that call themselves a prophet and they say goofy things. And a lot of times, if you've, if you've read kind of in the dark areas of literature about cold reading and about con men, it's, it's very much exactly that, about manipulation and, and those things. It's exactly that. And, and, and so the people of God, we're not supposed to be ignorant of the enemy's devices. We're not supposed to, yes, we're sheep, but we're sheep according to the shepherd. Right. We're sheep because we willingly follow the good shepherd. We're not sheep just to be prey to anybody who decides to seek their fangs into us. Right. And so we're sheep, but we're also carrying the armor of God. Right. <laughs> we're, we're sheep, but we're not defenseless. Oh, yeah. We're sheep, but we're an expanding kingdom of sheep. Right. We're sheep because we have the power of, of the shepherd in us, and we're led by him to yeah. great victory. And so um, sometimes people will abdicate, will, I'm sorry, not abdicate, people will um, forsake the, the, the responsibility that we have in ourselves. And they'll just say, well, whatever somebody says to me, I'll believe that. And if it was a lie, it's on them, but it will hurt you. It will hurt you. And so we, the Bible says to know them that labor among us. If somebody is going around us, saying, I'm a prophet, or I have a word for you, and things like that, that person needs to be real and right. That person needs to, because there is real and right. There's the genuine article. There really is. God speaks through people. Real words that, that are as, as true as anything else you will find. But there's, it's, it's not always easy to judge. And then we have, and then we have the knee-jerk reaction, don't judge. And so if you say, well, that wasn't a true prophecy, people are like, oh, don't judge, or they'll say, Don't touch the God's anointed. I'm like, I'm not so sure he is anointed. He was wrong. And, <laughs> and, and so there's there's this conflict. I, I don't know if you felt it as, as sharply as I felt it, but because um, I've I've been in this, this kind of ministry, and I've been a Pentecostal for so long, and I've traveled the whole country in ministering, and right now, you know, I'm I'm in some positions of leadership, so I've got to endorse some people until uh, other people don't use that person. And things like that, um, it, it's very, uh, I'm very aware of, of how people are manipulating others using the guise of a prophet. And so first thing I want to say, just before we even get into this, is um, a prophecy that comes generally, so through a YouTube video or a reel or a short, something that they're just blasting to the internet, is not for you. It's not for you. Um, it's not how prophecy works. A prophecy is a precious thing for uh, a specific people, and sometimes it is for a nation, and sometimes it is for a town like Nineveh. Mm -hmm. um, but it is—it's a personal thing. It, it's not something that you publish um, broadly and and just wherever it happens to hit, that was right, and never mind all the times it was wrong. We're gonna we're gonna get into the word and see about judging uh, prophets. Um, they're important to the work of God. Here's why. The, the Bible is true in his prophecy. The Bible is prophecy in many places, and it's true for everybody. But there are things that God wants to do with individuals. And there are needs that individuals have. 
And God cares about that too. And so sometimes God will go right to the individual and their need or their opportunity and speak to them through somebody who is submitted to him. And it's, it's, a, it's a deep responsibility. I, I have no doubt that as, as our church continues to develop and as we grow as individuals and get closer to God, as we, be, as we are those meat eaters and we're developing ourselves and finding ways to honor God and submitting to God, I have no doubt that we'll see more and more of the, of the gifts of the Spirit in our church as, as more people come and they need to be ministered to in specific ways and such. Uh, but if you, if you are uh, moved by God to give a word from Him, take it very serious. Don't paraphrase. Don't dumb it down. Say the whole thing. Um, and, and be bold in God when it's definitely God. And if you're not sure it's God, if you're not sure, be very careful. So Numbers 11.29 talks about God's desire that people would be so close to him he could speak through them. It says, and Moses said unto him, and Moses is the prophet. Moses is the one who went to Pharaoh and said, let my people, God says, let my people go. That's prophecy. God said this. And so Moses is a prophet and he's very well experienced and he's everything that he said is, is, is God's will has been true and everything he said that God said has been right. And, and Moses is a, an old hand at prophecy and he's experienced and trustworthy. He's proven himself. And Moses said unto him, Enviest thou for my sake? Would God that all the Lord's people were prophets? God wishes everybody was usable that way. And that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. All the way back in Exodus and Numbers, all the way back when Moses was leading the nation of God, he knew the will of God, the desire of God, and he, went, he knew that God wished everybody was as close to him as Moses was. Do you remember, I don't know how long it's been since you've read the Exodus story, but do you remember when God came to meet the people of God on the mountain? And he called them up and they were terrified and they sent Moses instead. That was their shot. That was their shot to be a nation of prophets, a nation of people who could talk face to face with God. But they, they abdicated. That was the word I was looking for before. They abdicated their role and their responsibility and they put it on Moses. And so Moses was the guy saddled with it from then on. And it doesn't look like they got op the opportunity again, at least not as a whole nation. But it was God's will that they would have, they would all be so close to God that they could speak the word of God and be his mouthpiece to nations and to each other. This is just the character of God. He wishes that he could trust us with his words. He wishes that we were so close that we could understand and hear his voice. That we wouldn't have so much crazy noise in our lives that would confuse us when God speaks. And I'm not saying that God is always trying to prophesy through us, but there are times when a prophet is needed and, and God is looking for somebody he can trust with his words. And there isn't always that person. I'll take you next to Ephesians 2, 18 through 22. It says, For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father, and therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, and of the household of God and are built up, uh, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus himself, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, being the, the, the ultimate expression of those apostles and prophets. Verse 21, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of, the God through, of God through the Spirit. And so we're built up by prophets, and, and we're, we, we have prophets throughout the Bible that we trust and we use, and they explain things about God and about the world, and we can trust that. And Jesus is the ultimate prophet, because you know, he is God in flesh. Now, you don't get much closer than that. You don't get much more right than that when you speak, when you're the one. And so if we're going to be like Jesus, and if we're going to be built up the way that he wants us to be built up first, um, we need the prophecy of the word alive in our lives. And if we're following him, we're going to follow in that same kind of, of ministry, that same kind of, of experience, that same kind of relationship with God. Jumping a few chapters later to Ephesians 4, 10 through 12. 
It says, he that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fulfill all things, speaking of Jesus. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body in Christ. And so we see some things there that qualify a prophet. A prophet benefits the body of Christ. Now, not all prophets are are positive people. Um, some prophets come and proclaim doom. Some prophets explain the reason for the judgment against people and nations. Some prophets throughout the Bible just didn't have anything good to say. Some of them were known for that. <laughs> Some of them had kings that would say, I hate that guy. He only ever prophesies destruction to me. But those are the words of God. That's how God feels about you, King. Fix it. <laughs> Get right. And so, um, not always positive, but always for the benefit of the body. And so, um, there was a time in Pentecost in our history where, where prophets were very often calling out sin that was hidden in the church. And it was a terrifying thing to go to a, a church meeting with some of these ministers because they had an insight from the Holy Ghost. And they would tell people what their sin was because it would be good if they would repent. And um, we don't have that so much now. And when I was saying that we have goofy people posing as prophets, if, if a prophet only ever has good things to say, if they're only ever telling you that you're going to drive a Cadillac and have a million dollars, and, and you say, I received that word, um, be careful if, if all they ever have to say is the things that you want. The Bible talks about uh, false witnesses that would tickle or itch um, itching ears, that, teachers that would that would scratch the itching ears of people, that would gather groups to themselves because they said what that group wanted to hear. And it's easy to blame things on God. Shannon and I were talking to our friends uh, just recently. There was a young man who went to Bible school with us, and he'd gotten, uh, <laughs> he had not been disciplined. Angela, you're praying for a good thing. This man had not been disciplined and got behind on his school bill, and he got invited not to come back uh, because he was, <laughs> at least until he paid his school bill. And, uh, and, and so he told everybody, God's telling me to, to quit school and just work at McDonald's, working my job more. Just blaming things on God. You've got to be careful with that. And so what is a prophet? Well, using the word itself, a prophet in, in the Bible can also be translated seer. And it's the people who understand things or are the representative of God. They understand the things of God and they're the representative of God. And you find them in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And what they do as the representative of God and speaking the word of God is they, they both foretell, so they tell things that are about to happen, like, hey, Nineveh, get right, or destruction's coming. And then they also sometimes will foretell, and they'll explain what's happening spiritually that's being, um, that's being borne out physically or, or in the community, things like that. So they'll explain God's um, active involvement behind the scenes. And this is still needed in the church. This is still needed in the church. The, the Bible isn't going to tell us everything that, that God has for us right now, uh, personally, and, and up here in Alaska, and things like that. Um, and being a prophet is a hard place to be. The Bible says to covet, or to covet the best gifts, but uh, being a prophet is a very difficult place to be. It's a hard place to be because you're, um, you're speaking words that aren't yours, but you're still going to bear the consequences. They're not your words, but people are going to hate you for them. Or people are going to have high expectations of you for them. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 11 says, But all these worketh that one, the selfsame spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. It's the spirit of God that empowers the prophet. And so the prophet has also this great responsibility to be right. I, I shared the definition uh, last time I taught of being prayed up. You know, living repentantly, being close to God, making sure you're not regarding any uh, sin or any iniquity or sin in your life so that uh, we can, the rest of us can expect that your, your ministry and your prayers are going to be effectual. Uh, we should be prayed up as ministers. Um, that, that all the more so for, I don't know if I can really say that, but, but prophets, the stakes are so high. You, you've got to be right. Mm -hmm. And any time somebody who is used in prophecy um, fails. It's, it's catastrophic because 
The prophecies that haven't come to pass yet are now under suspicion. And the prophecies that people had believed in before now are very fragile. And, and the faith that they've built up through speaking the word of God can be broken. Often prophecy also is not in, in, in whole or in total. And so you'll share what God gave you to share. And people are like, and then? And you're like, that's all I got. <laughs> that's all God gave me. And they're like, but when? Where exactly? How much? <laughs> and you, you can't go there. you got to stop where God stops. It's kind of like preaching the Bible. you got to go as far as the Bible goes, and then you've got to stop where it stops. And, and so being a prophet is um, oftentimes they prophesy in part, and, and we would say, if we were receiving it, incompletely, and they'll bear the brunt of, of, of the, the frustration for that. 1 Corinthians 13, 9 talks about that. He says, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. We don't know everything that God has planned. We don't know everything that God wants or, or is doing. We don't understand everything. God gave us a part and we share our part. And that's an important thing. If God is developing you in a ministry that includes uh, the, the gift of prophecy, uh, you've got to be careful first that you're willing to bear the consequences and second that you don't misuse it that you don't add to it, that you don't use the, the status. Somebody will say, oh, that guy prophesied, and it came true. You should listen to him, and then you use that to fleece people, or you use that to become popular uh, and, and not using it correctly. You could be popular, but um, using it, misusing the reputation that comes with it. And so Jesus is our greatest prophetic voice in all of Scripture. He's the greatest prophetic voice in all of history, and he prophesied of things like his own betrayal. And he prophesied of his own death and resurrection and, and much more. I've got a short list here. He prophesied that Judas would betray him, that Peter would deny him, and that the, the disciples would scatter after he was crucified. He knew this about them. And you got to know they felt bad when he said that to their face. <laughs> but it's the truth. He pronounced the desolation of three cities, and there's barely enough evidence for us to know that they existed today. They were almost completely wiped out of history. Uh, Terazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum. He prophesied about heaven and hell and gave us things that we never knew about them before. Most of the doctrine of hell, most of the understanding that we have about hell comes from Jesus himself. It doesn't come from the Old Testament. A lot of times people equate the Old Testament with the scary stuff, and they're like, oh, hell must be an Old Testament doctrine. It's not at all, not even a little bit. It is absolutely a New Testament doctrine from the words of Jesus. Jesus prophesied the destruction of the Jew Jewish temple and had people irate with him. Jesus prophesied the future growth of the church, the persecution of the church, and the falling away of the church. Jesus also prophesied deception and false prophets. Let's go to Matthew 24, 11. Jesus, being a real prophet, prophesied that there would be false prophets. And he prepared us as the church to be ready to know the difference between the genuine and the real and the false and the poisonous and the dangerous. Matthew 24, 11 says, And many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. And so that tells me two things. First off, there's a lot of voices, not just one, not a handful of voices, not the fringes, but there are a lot of voices that you really can't listen to. Many false prophets shall arise. They're going to be lifted. They're going to be popular. They're going to be known. They're going to be respected. They shall rise and shall deceive many. Now, it doesn't say exactly Christians, but, but who are they going to deceive? There's going to be a lot of people who believe these false prophets. So that means also that we can't, weigh, uh, we can't weigh them or judge them according to their popularity. We can't just go along with everything that everybody else agrees with. In fact, I, I don't remember exactly who said it. Maybe you do. Um, I think it was the author of Tom Sawyer, Mark Twain. But... Um, there, there is a saying that when you find yourself on the side of the majority, stop and take stock. Pay attention, because you might be wrong. The majority so often is wrong. And so Jesus says that there's going to be many false prophets that would follow after him. 
and it'll deceive many, many people. That's scary. It is. Because the people who are deceived, I don't think they're wrong. They're, I don't think they're dumb. I don't. I think that they believe and they want to experience and, and they desire God and somebody gets in and, and abuses that. Somebody gets in and co-ops that and deceives them. Matthew 7, 15 through 16, and then jump into 22 and 23 for the, for the sake of time. It says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. They fit in on the outside, but inside they have appetites for destruction. Verse 16, You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? And so you look at their results, and if they've got a wasteland behind them of broken lives and broken promises and lies and cheating, and, and, and they've got broken churches behind them, and they're never invited back to a place, you'll know them by their fruits. Beware of false prophets. You've got to watch out for them. Why? Because you're not going to know them when you first look at them. They come looking right, but inside. See, it's God who sees the heart. It's God who sees the inside. We are very bad judges of character, just to be perfectly honest. People in general are bad judges of character. One of the, one of the areas that, that is most expensive in business is hiring because everybody can talk a good talk. And you hire the wrong guy, and you spend six months training them, and then they steal from you, or or whatever, or or they just weren't who they said they were, and they're not diligent in the job, and so you got to fire them and start the process over. One of the biggest expensive expenses of almost any industry is the hiring process, and they are throwing billions of dollars. They're trying to use AI, they're trying to use psychology tools and tricks. They're doing everything they can to cut this expense because people are bad judges of people. Part of that, there's something I need to look up. You got your phone? Yeah. Would you look up um, in wrestling willful deception? There's a word for it. In professional wrestling, there's a word for you know it's a lie, but you go along with it anyway. Thank you for looking that up. Continuing on to that same verse, 22 and 23, it says, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And so we have false prophets, and now they're going to come face to face with the Lord, and there's judgment now, and they're going to say, aren't we good based on our works? Aren't we good based on our reputation for being prophets? Aren't we good on the ways that we encourage people to believe in you? Have we not prophesied in thy name? Didn't we give you credit when we were false prophets? And in thy name have cast out devils. So they actually had some spiritual power. And in thy name done many wonderful works. And I don't know if that means generous works or, or more miracles, but done many wonderful works in thy name. Gave you credit. And, and God's answer, Jesus' answer in, in judgment, he says, will be, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. That because they have that, that hunger, that appetite inside of them like ravening wolves, it doesn't matter how they look or how other people perceive them or what their reputation is or, or how much good they stack on the other side of iniquity. <laughs> iniquity makes them invalid. The, the inward ravening wolf self, the, the fact that they had appetites that were ungodly, uh, those who work iniquity, iniquity means lawlessness, you who broke my laws. It doesn't matter how many good things other people saw you do. If you were still breaking my laws, I never knew you. We were not in that kind of a relationship. Other people have gone so far as to say, and I don't think they're wrong, that knew you harkens all the way back to when Adam knew Eve. There was an intimacy and relationship, and, and, and it created life, and he says, I never knew you. We never had that nearness of relationship. Did you find the word? It's hard to, hard to pronounce, right? Kayfabe, that's it. Kayfabe. Kayfabe is a phenomenon that was only understood when professional wrestling uh, was sued, or when the WWF and WCW were, uh, were sued because they were operating as a, sports, uh, uh, as, as a sports team or a sports franchise, and there are certain laws that pertain to that. And so there was this big, this big like, question uh, and this big move 
that McMahon, uh, the CEO of those things, uh, did, where he came out and he actually said, it's fake. It's all stage. Now, when I was a little boy, you could not have convinced me that. <laughs> but in court, under threat of perjury, he said, it's fake. It's all staged. They're athletes, but they, he coined a term there, or he used a term that was coined recently, of sports entertainment. Sports entertainment. It's not actually sports. They're not actually competing to win. And so his argument was, because this is entertainment, it's like theater. It falls under those laws, and it doesn't fall under the antitrust laws and such, uh, like the NFL and, and, and NBA and things like that. And that was the, the thing he was doing. And so people all around were like, he admitted it's fake. Does that mean this is the end of professional wrestling? And if, if you've seen the promotions, no, it was not the end of professional wrestling. And so kayfabe became a word that was that was used, it's an older word, I believe it's German, an older word for a different phenomenon, but it, it kind of, its greatest expression of kayfabe is, is the wrestling fan, who knows rationally this is fake, this is wrong, but they still get excited, and they go along with it like it's real, and they talk about it like it's real, and they're willfully deceived. Kayfabe is willful deception. They chose to be deceived, and there's a lot of Christian kayfabe out there where, where objectively we know this person's lying to me. There's no way they could be talking to me if it's across YouTube. There's no way that, that what they said is true. They don't, they, they don't know the, the real situation in my life. But we'll kayfabe and we'll say, I received that. And we'll go along with it and act as, as if it were true. And we'll kind of cosplay Pentecostalism. And we'll, we'll pretend, and we'll dress it up, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll lie to ourselves. As a movement, this is very, very, very common. And so then, I, I, this is the answer to um, a grief that I had for a very long time. How do these false prophets, and everybody knows they're false prophets, in our movement sometimes, how do they still have a following? And how do they still get invited places? And things like that. And it's the willful deception of people. They want it to be true. Even though they know it's a lie, and so they go along with it, and they live as if it's true, and they talk as if it's true, and, and they're harboring somebody else's iniquity. And it's a danger. We've got to contend for the authentic. We've got to accept nothing less than the real. Jesus empowers um, true prophecy. But he's also judging prophecy. And he's saying, if they have iniquity, they don't know me. And so that's one of the ways that we can know a true prophet. If that person regards iniquity, if they, if they live lawless in an area of their life, they are not totally submitted to God, and they're not a candidate to be a real prophet. I'm not saying that people can't hear from God in sin. Certainly people feel conviction from God. They need to get right with God and, and turn around from their sin. Certainly people have been saved from dangerous and deadly situations because of the intervention of God. But God is not going to use somebody who regards iniquity to minister to others. You've got to consider the vessel. The God, Bible says that there are vessels of honor and vessels of dishonor. Vessels that are used for good things and vessels that aren't good for anything. And so we've got to consider uh, how a person lives their life, and that's part of the fruit that we'll know them by. You see, Muslims follow Muhammad, and Mormons follow Joseph Smith, and many Pentecostal factions follow their own prophets to their detriment. To their detriment. Because, why is it to their detriment? It's because they could have better in Jesus. You see, Jesus is still available to us. The ultimate prophet is still available to us. He's still speaking to people. He's still impressing folks with his direction. He's still beckoning us into a greater relationship with him. And it's tempting to forfeit our personal priesthood. It's tempting to forfeit the responsibility we have in following Jesus closely and just follow somebody else and try to shove the blame off on them. But it doesn't work. It doesn't work to follow a personality and say, well, if they're wrong, it's on them, and I'll be absolved because I didn't know any better. I was just following them. You know better because the Bible says so. The, the Bible determines what is right and what is wrong. The Bible determines what is a real prophet. And so we can't kayfabe our way through uh, to heaven. 
we, we must, we must know that we're right and, and not believe a lie. Not believe a lie. I know it's tempting to forfeit and abdicate the responsibility that we have. It is a weight to, to check doctrines and see, is that actually in the Bible? It is time-consuming to make sure you understand the character of God. Uh, being, um, uh, uh, being a student of the Word um, will take time and effort and energy, and then sometimes still you don't get it right, and somebody's got to straighten you out, but it's, it's worthwhile. We can't forfeit that. We can't just autopilot our spirituality. We can't autopilot our relationship with God is what that really is. We can't just follow personalities that are loud and flamboyant or popular with other people or, or like us and we identify with them. We can't just follow these people and say, well, it's their fault if I'm wrong. We have a personal responsibility of, of drawing near to God. And so here are the dangers of false prophets. And I'm, I'm nearly done. We've got a short time here together. The dangers of false prophets first is that they're wolves and they will devour you. They will devour you. They'll devour your time. They'll devour your attention. And very often they'll devour your pocketbook. Uh, ways false prophets have fleeced people include telling them that the world's going to end so just sign your house over to me. You would think people would see through that, right? These aren't dumb people. They're they're just going on autopilot. They're just making it somebody else's responsibility. This happens all the time. Uh, another way that, that false prophets will empty somebody's um, bank account is they'll say, well, I feel like you should give this. God told me you should give this. Or they'll prophesy anybody who plants a seed offering of X, Y, Z is going to get 100 times back or whatever. And so people who are, are gullible or people who maybe aren't gullible, but they've decided to just follow this person for a different reason, um, they'll, they'll go ahead and do that again and again and again. And so wolves will devour you. They'll devour you. Um, they're also thieves. They'll sell you out. They'll, they will sell you out. First off, they're, they're selling you to um, the slavery of deception. Uh, deception is just as enslaving as addiction. A deception is just as brutal and, and as enslaving as offense. And so they will sell you out to deception, but they're also selling out what's possible in your life. If you follow these people, you're going to lose out on the potential that you have, and you're giving it to them. Uh, your, your energies in pursuing God, if you're not pursuing God anymore because you've got a prophet that you're following on YouTube, or, or in person, I keep saying YouTube, but there's, there's people who do it in person, and, and, and they're, they're sneaky, and I believe there's a spirit behind them that makes them good at their job, and, and they will sell you out. Next is if you believe in them, uh, what happens when that prophet dies or leaves or backslides, fails? What happens to you then? There, there's a, a great big oneness Pentecostal group that follows a prophet. And I'm going to get his name wrong, so I won't say it. Um, and he died. Now, he, they thought he was the second coming of Elijah. But he died. And so what do you do then? Well, this group... They kept his car maintained in front of his house because he was coming back. For decades, they maintained his car in front of his house. maintained his house. And they, they pass around his preaching tapes and share his books. And, um, and they're, they're, they're still waiting. They're stuck. Um, one of the things that can happen when they die or, or fail or, or leave is, is you get stuck. That's one of the things that can happen. A lot of times people will backslide. They'll lose their own faith because their faith wasn't based on a personal relationship with God. Their faith wasn't based on what they knew for themselves out of the Word. Their faith was based on a relationship of getting told what to do by this spiritual person. Um, also, when you bring a prophet and you put a prophet above the Word of God, or you put your relationship with a prophet above or, or replace your relationship with Jesus, that's idol worship. That's idolatry. When you put something between you and God, when you put something above your relationship with you and God, that's idol worship. And so very often these spiritual teachers are, are idols in the flesh. And they replace God. Let, let's look at um, uh, Mormonism. Joseph Smith, um, he, he forges scripture. That's beyond, uh, you, you can't say that's not true. That, that's absolutely a fact. He forges scripture, changes it, and then says... Um, and then says, this is the new revelation. This is the extra revelation. 
And then the people who knew something about God had something to choose. Are we going to believe this? Or are we going to believe what God has preserved forever? And again, you would think that it would be like an easy decision, right? You would think that like, oh, well, smart people like me would never fall for that. But when your entire community has fallen for it, when you're going to lose your family if you don't go along with the kayfabe, it's not such an easy decision. And this is part of the battle that we have in reaching our community is we have so many religions and so many uh, Christian groups and such that have these traditions and, and they will kayfabe. They will be willfully deceived by traditions and vain philosophies and false prophets and liturgy and tradition. I already said that. And, and they, will, they will be willfully deceived by this because it's too hard to break and run for the truth. It's going to cost them to say, no, I'm going to stand for what's right and obviously in the Bible and things like that. And that's part of our, it's part of our work as the body of Christ in this area. We should pray about how to wisely help people who are in that position. We, we should prepare ourselves to be wise in helping people that are in that position. A prophet is only true when they're true according to the word of God. Anything a prophet says, uh, the prophet Muhammad said a lot of things against Christ in the Bible. That's how you know he's fake. They, they've got to fit within the confines of Scripture. I, I talk about Scripture being guardrails on your life a lot of the time. It's a good illustration. They've got to fit in between the guardrails. And if they're outside the guardrails beckoning you to them, they're calling you into destruction. If they're outside of the Bible. And so a true prophet first is only true if they're true according to the word of God. And secondly, a prophet is known by their by their fruit, like an apple tree. Is that a sour crab apple tree? Or is that a red delicious apple tree? We'll wait until fall and you'll find out. Um, the true prophets of God, they operate differently than people who want attention. I, I know some people who are honest prophets. Who, who have been used in prophecy consistently. And um, they're, they're not the people who wear the big chains and, and the bright clothes and are on Facebook Live every hour they can be asking for money. They're, they're not the attention seekers. Very often they're too busy getting close to God for that. Yeah. Um, the people who operate in prophecy, the people who are blessed with the gift of prophecy uh, consistently, um, they are consistent people. They, they are consistent in their walk with God. They're going to be consistent with you. And um, they're not like, like, like the so-called prophet Muhammad. He waffled this way and that. And he said, well, this is a sin. Well, no, it's not. I was deceived. And if you read their history, um, the history of Islam, you see where he went this way and that until he kind of figured out a basis of what he could get away with. Uh, likewise, uh, Joseph Smith. First, black people are demons, and then, oh, wait, no, that's illegal now in the state, so we're going to say they're not demons now, and, and uh, having multiple wives is definitely the will of God until it becomes uh, illegal, and, oh, God told me it's not the will of God anymore because it will send us to jail. Convenient. Um, prophets who really are receiving from that one self-same spirit are going to be consistent no matter what happens. You see, there was the prophet um, Elisha who continued through persecution. All the other prophets are being killed all around him. He's sure he's going to die too. And, and he says, God, I'm the only one left. And of course he was wrong. And so God gave him another revelation. that No, there's a bunch of people that haven't bent the knee. You're in good company among the people who aren't you know, turning to idol worship. But, but he, he was consistent through that. Consistent all the way through that. Look at uh, Joseph who interpreted dreams. I, I think that fits well within uh, prophecy there. Uh, foretelling what it is that God is communicating through dreams. And he's, he's consistent. Consistently a good guy. Consistently raising up in the workplace because of his diligence. Consistently giving God the honor. Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the world, says, Hey, I hear you interpret dreams. And he says, I do not. God does. Resist the temptation to be built up in his ego. Real prophets are consistent. Now, they're consistent in their attitudes. They're consistent in their relationship with God. Real prophets also, I won't say that they're, they're inconsistent, but real prophets also are directed by the Spirit. And so, even though they're consistent, um, you might not be able to predict what they're going to do. Um, and so, we've, we've had prophets who, because God told them to, just pack up the car and move. Or, or go to give a word. Um, 
Stories of showing up at churches that aren't even Pentecostal, that don't have a history of receiving prophets, and just showing up and saying, I'm ready to preach. And they're like, then preach. And, and God makes a way. And so um, while they're consistent, they're also not, not very uh, predictable. A prophecy isn't on demand or scheduled. <laughs> um, prophecy is as the Spirit will. As the Spirit will. And so there's this unfair joke that goes around. It's a real thing that happened in the story. We had a man in our, or we have, he's still alive. Uh, he's retired now, but we had a man who was very well known for prophesying in services. He, he wasn't one who wore the label prophet, but people knew, and other people were skeptical, and he had to deal with that. <laughs> and so there's this really well-told story. It goes around a lot. Um, he was at general conference, and he said uh, to somebody, hello, my name's you know, me. And, they, and he asked, what's your name? And the guy said, you're the prophet, you tell me. That's unfair. <laughs> it's not on demand. It's not how it works. That was a little bit unfair to the guy. Um, it's not on demand. And so you can't pay somebody $7 to get seven words of prophecy. On demand. Um, there, there being, I, I, I resist the notion that the Holy Ghost will move when we count down from five or ten or however many. Um, the, the Spirit moves as the Spirit will. Severally as he will. And so... Um, that's another way that you could have an inclination if somebody is, is really being used by God. Prophets don't speak air. We, we need to go to a, a scripture. I don't know where I saved it here. <clears throat> Let's go to Deuteronomy 18.20. That might be it. Regardless if this is a scripture I intended or not, prophets don't speak air because they're speaking for God. They don't speak air. And but the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. These are the standards that prophets are held to. Death. Now, I don't think you should shoot the televangelists. But I think you should kill all of their influence in your life. If somebody is saying things that are false... If somebody prophesies and it ever doesn't come true, that person's suspect and they should not have influence on you. Amen. Whatever they say after that point should be weighed. Don't just accept that because other people say that's a real prophet. If you know that what they said did not happen, then, then your, their influence is not total, it's not absolute. They, they don't automatically get the pass that they're speaking for God. Uh, God commands charlatans to be killed in the Old Testament consistently. This isn't the only scripture. The, the standard is very high for a prophet. And so if you are being moved by God to give a prophetic word, I want to give you a little bit of coaching, a little bit of advice. I, I've been used in prophecy. Uh, I'm not ashamed to say it. Uh, not very often, to be perfectly honest. But God has given me um, understanding to share with other people about what would happen next or why things were happening now. And uh, it's something I take very seriously. But at the beginning, when, when I was first used this way, being full of the Holy Ghost, I, I knew that I was a candidate because I knew that I was right. I, you can know that you're right. This is something I've been hitting on and preaching. You can know that you're pure. You can know that you're righteous. You don't have to always live in limbo. I hope that I'm not going to hell. You can know. I did everything the Bible said to do, Amen. and I'm, I'm not harboring any secret sins, and I've repented of everything I did before, and I am right. And so first I was that way. I had that status. Um, in myself, uh, that knowledge, a confidence of being righteous. And, and then God was impressing me with an understanding that I needed to share. And so what I did, because I knew this about the Bible, that the, the standards of a prophet are extremely high and stringent, I, I knew that um, I, I could, with wisdom, couch what I was going to say. And what I mean by couch, you might not use that term, I, I could soften it. And so instead of saying, thus saith the Lord X, Y, Z, I could say, I feel like you should look into this. Is this true about what you're going through? And I, I could ease into it without trying to impress anybody. I could be humble about what God had given me for this other person. And you can too. You can be wise about the way that God uses. Just like we can speak the truth without love and destroy people, or we can speak the truth in love and build people up and draw them into the kingdom of God. You can be used in the spirit in wise ways. You don't have to just say everything that comes to your head and then blame it on God. Amen. Um, some of our, our young ministers could use some more coaching about how to be used in the 
and the gifts of the Spirit, if they would receive it. Um, and so there's this high standard of prophets, and there's real prophets, real people who are used in prophecy, um, and, and we need that as a movement. It's something special about the Pentecostals. Not every, every church believes in prophecy or would receive somebody who spoke in prophecy because they, they don't um, pursue the, the spiritual things of God. They're not interested in the, in the spiritual giftings. Uh, they don't expect it. The Bible says you have not because you ask not, not and they're not asking for the spiritual gifts. And, and so it's something special about the Pentecostal movement and it's something that helps us, really improves our movement and is good about our movement. But we've got to make sure that it's right and good. Jesus is both... Um, the greatest prophet and not only a prophet. Jesus um, is also the inspiration of, of prophets, the, the voice behind prophets. And so I would tell you this also. Instead of chasing spiritual woo-woo people, instead of pursuing signs and wonders, your time is best spent in getting close to Jesus the Spirit behind every true work of the Spirit. Your, your time is best spent understanding the character of the God that empowers. Your time is best spent in prayer getting closer to God, in yielding to the Holy Ghost yourself, in developing yourself in the disciplines and, and, and developing yourself in the convictions and the submission to God, that getting close to Him. And then if God needs to interrupt your life with a prophet, He'll send one. And you'll be close enough to God to know the sound of his voice. And so I want to encourage you in that way also. That while prophets are real, they're, they're not as important as your relationship with God. Right. You don't need a prophet to get to heaven. You don't need a prophet to grow in your relationship with Christ. A prophet is a sometimes help to the church. Not a constant, persistent thing. We don't see that. In scripture, we see people who are used consistently, but it's not necessary for your salvation or even for your development. And so I want to encourage you that, yes, expect prophecy to be real. Yes, expect God to speak that way to our church and to you personally. Um, anticipate it even. But instead of chasing voices that seem to be prophetic, personalities that seem to be prophetic, instead of chasing those things, chase Jesus and get as close to him as you can, get as submitted to God as you can, and honor God in every area of your life. And maybe God will inspire you in that way, to interrupt somebody else's life with a prophetic word. Would you stand with me? I just want to pray in closing. We did fill the time. That's great. I, I, it wasn't that important to me, but we got through the material, which is which is important. This is, this is key, because false prophets and, and fake signs and wonders are something that really could sidetrack and damage our church and our mission and our families and our, our individual growth. Um, and so let's pray that we would get close to God, that no false prophet would ever be able to deceive us. That's the answer. That's the answer. Is that you're so close to God that you know deception when you hear it. That you're so close to God that it doesn't matter how good they look like a sheep on the outside. Uh, you you are, are close to God, and he can give you discernment about what their appetites are on the inside. Yeah. Let's pray about our nearness to God. Dear Lord, I pray, God. Dear Lord, first, yes, that you would give this church continued gifts of the Spirit. Dear Lord, I pray that your Spirit would never be hindered in this place, God, that you would always be able to do what it is that you want to through and by and in and for us. But dear Lord, I pray, God, dear Lord, that we would have the wisdom to prioritize our relationship with you. And dear Lord, that we wouldn't go chasing off after every siren voice. Dear Lord, that we wouldn't be shipwrecked, dear Lord, like so many others. But dear God, instead, we would be tied to you, God. Dear Lord, that we would be founded upon that rock, which is our salvation. In Jesus' name, God, I pray you would inspire us, God, and lead us in ways to grow closer to you. Dear Lord, I pray that we would seek out ways that we could submit to you better. Dear Lord, I pray that we would close down every other voice, God, that would contend against you and the knowledge of you in our lives. In Jesus' name, Lord, I pray that we'd turn them off. We'd close them up. In Jesus' name. And dear Lord, I pray, God, in our sincere desire for all the, the blessings that you have and all the signs and wonders that you're able to do, God, I pray that we would earnestly contend for that best gift, which is a personal relationship with you. In Jesus' name.
Yes, Lord, and amen. Yes, Lord, and amen. Thank you for your time tonight. We're not so many, but this can be a this could be a, something that we use to protect our church and the other people around us. And we can be sure that nobody falls for those kinds of things. And we can know what is real when it comes and cherish it all the more and not wonder in the back of our mind, ah, well, we can know what's real according to the Bible. Greet each other before you go. Let's fellowship a little bit. Thank you. For